Okay, well, good morning to you all. It's uh, Tuesday, January the 26th. Headed out for a Riker commute this morning. Still annoyed at my uh, alignment issue, but I'm in the mood to ride today. I don't care if I have to fight it. Uh, and <laughs> funny enough, uh, James, I just saw your uh, message on YouTube. I haven't uh, read it yet or replied, but uh, uh, James Thorne just replied to me on my alignment update video that I posted a couple days ago, and he said, oh, we need to get you in for another tune-up. So yes, yes, and yes, it needs to be done. You stay on that side, I'll stay on this side. Oh man, it's all right. Look at this. I'm just letting off the... Look how far it's tracking to the right. I want to let off of it. It's tracking that hard to the right. Oh my god, this thing drives me nuts. Okay, time to just drive aggressive and forget about it. Um, yeah, so... James uh, says that he wants to get me tuned up on the alignment, so I'm going to take him up on the offer. Uh, my original thought on the thing is I'm just going to leave it with him if he agrees to that and uh, I'll just let him sort through this thing whatever it takes I don't care but I think when we get this thing on the lift and uh, put the laser on it we're going to figure out that it is way off again and uh, I don't know how that is that the uh, dealer up there uh, Broadway Power Sports how it was aligned according to their system but there's no way this is aligned so I'm, I'm not on the crown of the road here. I'm just going to be next to it. Or I'm not going to kill myself here. I let off. Look how hard, fast this is tracking to the right. Oh, it's terrible. And uh, it's got to be some fairly excessive uh, toe out because if you hit a dip or a bump or a depression or off camber, anything that's on the right side, you know, half of the bike, the bike darts, I mean hard that direction. It takes off so fast you can barely correct it before you end up in the weeds. And uh, the, uh, the counterpoint to that is when you, uh, when you correct out of it, you end up going really fast the other direction. So I don't know, if both of them are towed out and it just happens to be more on the right side in reference to the rear wheel thrust angle or what the deal is, but we'll find out when he gets it up on the uh, alignment jig and takes a look at the numbers. And if we find out that it's close to what factory says is zero, then that means there's something definitely bent on the bike. Uh, and it's always been this way, you know, since day one. Don't even do it. Just sit there and mind your manners. Um, <laughs> my first few rides on it I noticed that it was pulling hard to the right like this so that tells me that there's got to be something in the control arm that's bent or maybe the mounting points probably on this right side that aren't square uh, something's just off and if it's not repairable or fixable uh, with the parts that are on it maybe we can adjust out of it enough to make it tolerable uh, you know new control arms probably aren't all that terribly expensive but I hate throwing money at it and not knowing if it's gonna fix it or not because then it's just wasted time money effort everything uh, I'm getting kind of to my wits end at throwing money into this thing to try to resolve its handling problem uh, I'd much rather move on to something else if I'm just gonna end up turning this thing into a money pit and I don't see the value of that I'm already annoyed at it and it's just kind of pushing me so anyway uh, and I, I let me qualify all this with I know it's not all Rikers that do this and that's kind of been my posture on this the whole time is something about this bike is off uh, and I've opened a couple of tickets with uh, Can-Am about it and you know the local dealers here don't have the alignment equipment to verify it so every time you go in and have it looked at you've got to pay for that out of your own pocket which again you know it's a hundred bucks 125 but I don't care that's that's pocket change if it fixes the problem. But if you have to keep going back and doing that again and again and again, then no, that's not pocket change anymore. That's pissed offness. So uh, anyway, I've ridden dozens of other Rikers, probably close to 20 now, I guess. Not dozens, but a dozen and change. Uh, and none of them handle as badly as this one does. So I don't know. It's been a problem since day one. Maybe I just got a lemon. 
if I could get the handling sorted out to where it's at least tracking straight and not diving right on every bump, uh, then I'll get my Elka suspension dialed in and uh, this would be a very fun bike to ride around all the time. Minus the fuel economy. You know, fuel economy sucks, but it is what it is. <laughs> it's kind of funny when uh, I'm doing my commutes uh, on any of the other bikes, you know, I know what they're doing fuel-wise. It's, you know, it's predictable. 50, 60, 70 miles to the gallon. Uh, when I ride this one, I'm always looking at it going, really? 23 miles to the gallon? Are you serious? And that's pretty close to an accurate number, give or take about one or two actual MPG. Anyway, uh, I was coming home in my Accord yesterday, and... Uh, I was doing 80 miles an hour on the toll lanes coming in or coming this direction. And my average for the entire 20, 28 mile trip that I took from downtown area, uh, I got 31.6 miles to the gallon at 80 miles an hour in that Accord. This is smaller, lighter, has less than half the size of the motor and it gets 25 in town if I'm lucky. It's crazy. So an ideal commuter, this is not. Yeah, I think the best fuel economy I've seen out of it is uh, on some of my highway runs, uh, slow, twisty mountain roads and stuff that I did in Arkansas and a couple of other places where my average speed was around 55, and uh, I actually got decent fuel economy out of it. It was up in the 36, 37 range, but as soon as you get up in the... Uh, you know, above 65-ish, which is, you know, where everybody drives here in Houston. Uh, that's, it just falls off real fast on the economy. And I forgot to mention that I'm uh, riding naked again today. Took the screen off uh, the other day when I took my toddler for a ride so she could get some breeze in her face. And uh, I just didn't put it back on. And today is supposed to be fantabulous as far as weather. Uh, it's cloudy right now, but high 50s, like 58 degrees. Uh, we're supposed to be up to 74 today, clear skies. Oh, yeah. That's riding weather. So I'm already feeling the wind blast on the chest. I'm so accustomed to having that screen up here and not having to hang onto the bars. to make a spot. Oh, this thing is all over the road. Yeah, so hopefully you guys can hear me over the wind blast. Um, Kevin, Bikes and Pizza on Instagram, uh, had a little mishap with his Riker, or, or more specifically, somebody else had a mishap with his Riker. I won't talk about too many of the details because I don't know if he wants all that public, but uh, basically somebody uh, was riding his bike and uh, whacked it into a curb or something and uh, seriously damaged the right side wheel, I think he said it was, one of the wheels. Uh, so the wheel and the uh, brake rotor were both bent and the bike was thrown a VSS fault, so he had to tear his whole bike apart, fix that, and he's getting it painted now, so it's looking naked. <laughs> he stripped it down to the frame and took off all the plastic bits that he can to get it all painted. That's cool. Oh, man, this thing's all over the road. Oh, I forget how much wind there is when there's no windscreen running 70 75 here and really have to lean into it so all of my other uh, motorcycle projects and uh, camping and trips and all that's kind of on hold right now through my busy season I'm just kind of starting to get toward the the end of the really busy part and I still have probably oh, maybe another four weeks of uh, kind of overstuffed schedule but I'm going 
going to try to sneak out in the next you know, two, maybe three weeks sometime and uh, do a little trip maybe over to the uh, Sabine National Forest. Uh, Neil and Adrian and I had discussed that. Uh, Nick up in Oklahoma wanted to go too, but it might be a little early for his schedule. Uh, yeah, let's get out and do a few days of moto camping, maybe you know, a four-day weekend or something like that. We'll see. I have a big box full of accessories that I'm going to be installing on the CT125. But I'm waiting for a couple more to show up so I can just do it all in one shot. Uh, I still haven't gotten my Zeta uh, Adventure windscreen and the uh, engine guard uh, that I was planning on putting a couple of little fold down foot pegs, highway pegs on it. Uh, oops, getting through that light. Um, I'd like to do it all in one shot, but uh, I'm getting tired of waiting, so I don't know how long that part or those parts uh, the the screen and the engine guard uh, they've been on back order uh, through we bike and I'm not sure if or when they're going to show up and I still need to send off the measurements uh, I took some fairly detailed measurements and pictures and I think what I'm going to do is take a, a couple of short little videos of the measurements on the back of the trail cub and uh, also the super cub and send those off to uh, Kip Moto to have him build the hoop uh, for the Surepax trailer. It would be nice if one hoop would work for both bikes, but I don't know if that's possible because of the way the uh, exhaust is on the right side of the cub. You know, it's kind of right in the way of where the uh, uh, basket or the hoop would pivot down. Uh, so I don't know. We'll see. And it would be, really be a one-off because I don't know if anybody else is going to carry <laughs> or pull the trailer on a Super Cub. I might be the only crazy guy in the world that wants to do that. Uh, Adrian might because he and uh, I have seen the benefit of uh, Neil's trailer. So we're really considering that for the Cannonball. So I need to get those uh, measurements sent off. And hopefully, uh, depending on this production schedule over there for Kit Moto, they can get those uh, hoops built before the Cannonball Run in July. Hopefully well before that, because I want to hook it up and test with it, ride with it, see how it plays. That is my plan for uh, carrying spares on the uh, Cannonball Run. That way I can have my tire and my camping gear and, you know, spare chain, all the uh, stuff that I need uh, for that 9,000 mile trip, you know, just carry everything with me. Uh, want to keep the light load as light as possible, but uh, then again, I need to be self-sufficient on the road, so at least one tire and you know, tools and all that stuff, which would be kind of hard to put on the uh, rear rack and the panniers, but I don't know. I'll figure it out. Anyway, I've arrived. It's breakfast time, and I'll uh, catch up with y'all in just a bit. Okay, well breakfast is done. It was a very long extended breakfast today. I've been sitting there an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> I need to get to work. Uh, met a very interesting gentleman in here uh, that I never knew. Uh, I knew of him and uh, he didn't know of me but he knew of my work uh, from over 20 years ago uh, when I was in the uh, day trading uh, stock market uh, circles. I was the uh, systems engineer that built a lot of the uh, early high-frequency day trading stuff. Uh, are we going to be able to get out? This guy picked a bad spot to park. Right. Okay, where was I? <laughs> uh, anyway, he, uh, he was one of the founding members of a big day trading group here in Houston uh, back in the mid-90s. And I've worked with uh, a lot of his other partners. Uh, through the years and uh, we had just never met uh, and he never knew my name I never knew his but we know a lot of the same people and uh, it was an interesting conversation we were rehashing some of the good old trading days and back when uh, high frequency day trading was the thing before decimalization back when you can make a 16th which was called a teeny uh, you can make a 16th up or down now with decimalization, it's, uh, geez, I don't know. I don't know how many places they carry that decimal out, but you can't make much. There's not uh, a big margin to be had. 
anyway, we uh, we talked about uh, technology and how the things have changed, and he might have some new business opportunities that I might be interested in. I haven't done anything in the uh, trading world in quite a number of years, but it can uh, be quite lucrative. Anyway, I am late for my appointment. Need to get on the road here. <laughs> It's funny, though, because I told him about uh, kind of my exit from the uh, trading world and uh, business opportunity that went really sideways, how I got severely, severely shorted uh, in that business deal uh, to the tune of several million dollars. <laughs> and he, uh, he's like, oh, my God, I wish I'd known you. He, this guy's an attorney. He said, I wish I had known you then because I would have uh, gotten you in contact with some really vicious lawyers and you definitely would have gotten paid. <laughs> Oh well, too late now. I often wonder how my life would have turned out different if a few business adventures uh, that I embarked on had turned out differently. I've never been a good businessman. Uh, I'm too nice, I guess. I don't know. Just too nice. I'm there to get the work done. I'm not necessarily there to be uh, cutthroat on the money side of things, which is what you really have to be. You've got to be a ruthless bastard to make uh, the kind of money that a lot of those guys make. And the reason they make it is because they're ruthless bastards. I just uh, enjoy doing the work, and I guess maybe that's my downfall as far as money is concerned. I still make a comfortable living. I'm not complaining, but you know, when you get stiffed for anywhere from six to $10 million on a business deal that you had equity in, that uh, kind of hurts. <laughs> it's just funny talking with him because we know all the same people and, no, not all the same people, a lot of the same people. Uh, I educated him on a few things that he didn't know about uh, from those trading days. He did not know uh, how some of that stuff worked. <laughs> things that there are laws against now. <laughs> uh -oh. oh no, not playing with a crane. See you later. Damn, that crane is doing over 70 miles an hour. Woo it's windy without a windscreen on here. I need to call James today. I replied to him. Uh, while I was sitting there at breakfast uh, on my YouTube messages. So I need to give him a call today and get on his calendar. If I can leave the bike with him, I'll leave the bike. Just have him sort it out. Fix it, ride it, go have fun with it. But he told me that uh, he's got some new information. He's been speaking with and working with some other uh, alignment pros in the industry regarding these Rikers and he's got some new uh, measurements and stuff like that that he wants to try out on my new calibration so we'll see it might work anything to fix this silly tow out problem will be great ah, man it's so hard to keep this thing in one lane <laughs> All right, you go, man. You go, you go. I'm going to get right on around you, too. One thing I never do is follow behind a truck or somebody towing something or an open bed or uh, anything because, man, you just don't know what's going to drop off of them. One of my ugliest close calls I can remember was following behind a tow truck I was on my uh, Goldwing Interstate and uh, just tootling along through Oklahoma City and I was trying to make a clean pass and get around this tow truck but there was nowhere for me to go and uh, you know 60 miles an hour on the highway out on I-40 and uh, a big wrench of some kind it's one of those uh, strap locking uh, crowbar wrench fell off the back of this uh, wrecker he didn't have it secured in the toolbox whatever uh, hit the ground I saw sparks and something giant and uh, 
I just barely dodged it. It missed my right knee by about, I don't know, four inches at 60 miles an hour. Holy crap, you wanna talk about come to Jesus moment. Man, I'd have lost my leg right there. All right, well, just about arrived for my appointment. An hour late. <laughs> So we'll sort this out. Uh, this client had a whole office move that had to be done and uh, we took care of that over the last day or so. And uh, today is just gonna be kind of the finishing touches on it and get them all sorted 100%. And uh, that's that. I bid you all farewell for now. I might catch you for my uh, afternoon ride toward my next stop. I'm not sure where that's going to be quite yet, but we shall see. Catch you all later. Okay, well, welcome back to my day in progress. It's uh, close to noon, I guess, somewhere around about. Yeah. Oh, yep, 12.42, so it's almost 1. Finished up here at the client site, got everything moved and sorted out, and they are cooking with heat, so... My job here is done, I think. And uh, I don't really have anything else on the books today. I do have a couple of calls waiting um, for me to have time. So I'm gonna go back to my warehouse, swap the Riker for another bike, because I'm no longer in the mood to put up with a alignment issue. <laughs> it annoyed me enough this morning. Um, I sent a couple of messages uh, back and forth with James at uh, Thornoli's and he's got appointments available mid-February so that's a couple three weeks away so I think the Riker is going to be parked for a couple three weeks. I just don't want to deal with it. It's annoying me. So I'm going to go to the warehouse, uh, take care of a couple of calls, uh, do a little bit of rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic over there and uh, I'll leave the Riker and bring home one of the other bikes. Maybe I'll bring home one of the scooters. Hey, you spinning that tire. Uh, I might bring home one of the PCXs. I haven't ridden those in a while. I never did my uh, post-mortem on the uh, CVT uh, issue on the white PCX, uh, where it was kind of stuck in a, a mid-ratio. It wouldn't go down to the lowest ratio. It was kind of bogging out the motor. Um, so I might, uh, I might take the white one home and tear that, uh, thing apart. The gray one also needed to have the, uh, rear drive assembly checked because it was making a squeaking, warbling, scraping sound. So I don't know what that was all about. I'll sort that out eventually. I think I'll take the white one home today. Haven't done that. I said that I was going to do that months ago and just never got around to it. Get busy with so many other projects. <laughs> I've got a pile of them waiting for me at home already. Uh, I need to put my XT250 back together. I pulled the, the front caliper off of it so I could replace the front pads and uh, resurface my front rotor a little bit. And uh, then I got a, a rear full re rebuild kit for the rear brake, uh, stainless braided line, a caliper rebuild, fresh pads, all that. So I need to do the brakes on that bike and get it on the road again. I need to hook up my trailer mount for the Sherpax on there and start playing with the Sherpa, Sherpax trailer. Uh, lots and lots of projects. Not enough time. When I have time, I don't have money. When I got money, I don't have time. <laughs> kind of mutually exclusive. Ah, God, this alignment so bad. So James's uh, email to me was uh, he he needed a little more clarification on what Broadway Power Sports did. So I'll dig up my uh, service notes that they did uh, on the alignment. Uh, if I remember right, they gave me a sheet that kind of had the numbers on it. Uh, if not, I'll call them and see if they can 
email that to me. Uh, I'm sure they've got it in their system. Uh, and he said that he's got some new numbers, uh, new alignment figures that he wants to try out on my bike uh, that he's gotten from the professional community in his circles. So uh, we'll see if that makes any difference on my bike. Anything's got to be better than what it is right now. Good God. And I know somebody out there's probably listening to this going, geez, this guy gripes a lot. <laughs> Ride my Riker. You'll understand. <laughs> Ask Kevin. <laughs> Ask uh, Bikes and Pizza. He'll tell you. This thing is a handful. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah, it's a giant hole. Yeah, it's, it's just almost... Uh, uncontrollable on rough roads. Hell, even on smooth roads, it's almost uncontrollable. It's crazy. I've thought about trading this in for uh, an F3S because uh, I don't really want to get into a full dress uh, three-wheeler, you know, like an RT or even the Limited or anything like that. Just, I don't know, they're too big and heavy. I want something light and athletic, but I don't want it to be flighty and uncontrollable like this. had plenty of full dress bikes and big heavy monsters and I just don't want any more of that. I don't know. So if this can't be sorted out, uh, I might just get out of the three wheel platform completely for a while. Uh, I think probably what I'll go to is, uh, if not the F3S, uh, I'll go over to the uh, Vanderhall, which isn't a bike anymore. It's a car, but you know, that's all right. I really like the Vanderhall. I don't really like the $32,000 price tag, but... All over the road. Stay over here, bike. Riding this thing in traffic is just nerve-wracking because it's always left and right, left and right, and it'll start doing that jockeying nonsense right next to another car. And it feels good out here today. We're not up to our 74 degrees yet, but I'm betting it's about 70. Uh, it's just phenomenal. We only have a few weeks of this uh, weather here in Houston. It's usually very early in the spring. Late winter, early spring is when it uh, is extremely nice to ride here. Once we get to about March, meh, it's already getting hot and humid. There's that clunk in my suspension. I don't know if you guys could hear that. Every time I load and unload the suspension, you can feel and hear a clunk up here on the left. I don't know if it's that sway bar or what. And that started within just the first few hundred miles of uh, ownership. Uh, when I noticed it was uh, when I had my dealer, Wild West, install the uh, BRP sway bar, the 30% stiffer sway bar on this thing. So I guess it could be the end link or something that's causing that, but I don't know, I've yanked around on those and they're tight. I can't make them pop. It's only when the suspension is loaded and unloaded, and it's not the brake caliber. It's definitely a frame uh, something more fixed that's making that noise. Because when you just lightly tap the brakes and get off of them, it doesn't clunk or make any noise. It's only when the suspension is loaded and yeah, whatever. That's only a problem if it's uh, you know a bad bushing or something, but it's just annoying. Okay, well, I have arrived. I'm going to uh, sit in here and do a little bit of work for an hour or so and then uh, swap bikes and head out. So, I bid you all farewell. Thanks for tagging along.